Alrighty, we can go ahead. Um, I'll get started with introductions. So for those of you who don't know, my name is Amelia Wald. I'm the executive director of the Virginia Club of New York. So if you've come to Virginia Club events before, you might recognize my face. You might be sick of my face by now, but I am really, really thrilled to introduce Jack Ford. Jack is the co-chair of our Who's an Entertainment Committee along with Janelle Clayton, who is also here in the call. They're gonna be moderating the Q&A for us. So if you have questions that come out, come about throughout the course of the conversation, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen. And if you see someone else's question that you really love, go ahead and give that question an upvote to indicate to Jack and Janelle the popularity of those questions. And you can feel free to put a question in at any point. Uh, we'll come back to them as soon as we hit the audience Q&A. So with that, I would love to turn it over to Jack Ford. Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to Ready Who's Action. Um, again, I'm Jack. And I'm Janelle. Um, and we're co-chairs of Who's in Entertainment, a um, community of interest uh, from the Virginia Club of New York. So as a group, we bring together folks in the entertainment industry to network and learn. And that brings us to tonight. We're joined by Kirk Martini, who's a professor of design and photography in the A School at UVA. And Professor Kirk will be chatting with Orit uh, Jacoby Carroll on her journey from UVA to where she is now. And we're really excited to have you both. And from now, I'll pass it on to Professor Martini and Orit. Thanks very much, Jack. Um, so I've asked to give a, I'm Kirk Martini. I'm a structural engineer teaching the architecture school. I've taught there since uh, 1992. Um, I first met Orit in the fall of 1994, my third year of teaching. And she took my course in structural design and she graduated in 1995 worked in some architecture firms after that, and then went to Princeton grad school. Uh, took a job in uh, a distinguished engineering firm, uh, uh, Guy Nordenson's firm in New York, and worked there through 2000. And then she uh, took a turn with her career and got interested in theater, did an internship in theater, and one thing led, led to another. And if you check the internet Broadway database, you'll find that she's done about two or three Broadway shows per year for more than a decade now um, as an associate scenic designer. And I think what we'll do this evening is talk about maybe what brought you to my classroom and then how you got from there to where you are now. Um, so just start off with uh, what led you to major in architecture at UVA? Well, it was, an interest of mine since really elementary school, but I got very into architecture in high school. Um, I came from a family of engineers and mathematicians. So I sort of grew up doing math summer camp and things like that. <laughs> and I just always was very interested in math and science and engineering and building. Um, but at the same time, I was a ballet dancer. Uh, I did a lot of art. Uh, I did a lot of theater. Um, by high school, I was doing every single day dance lessons, theater, performing three, four shows a year. Um, and it was very much a deep interest, but yet very uh, separate from my academic work. So it was sort of an interesting situation. In my classwork, I was doing physics and math and a couple of art classes, but mostly very like hardcore into math and science. And then after school, I would go and I would dance and I would dance and I loved it. Um, but it was always something that I thought would be a hobby and secondary. I knew I wasn't going to be a performer. I didn't have that. Uh, drive is not the right word because I had drive, but not for that. I mean, there's a, I think even then as a kid dancing, there was a lot of clarity that there's a real level of passion to become a professional performer. And that was never my passion. Um, and I will say there was a bit of family expectation that at some point that would stop and you would get a real job. And a real job included engineering and mathematics, <laughs> basically, mm -hmm. or a science. And, but, you know, I think I, my love of art was recognized all along. And 
architecture kind of emerged in talks with family friends and you know everybody would say oh you like art and math you should be an architect like almost as a joke but it took on a life of its own as I was growing up and my high school actually offered architectural drafting I kind of took some of those vocational classes as electives and by the time I was applying to college I only applied to architecture schools for better or worse that's mm -hmm. a that's a, a little bit of a separate conversation like deciding when you're 16 that you know what you're going to do for the rest of your life and heading into a pre-professional program uh, is that's a choice um, but thankfully at UVA the architecture school is also like a really solid liberal arts degree um, I had a pretty good idea that I did not want to go into one of the really pre-professional engineering architecture uh, um, I mean, people probably aren't super familiar, but there's some licensure things and there are programs that are a lot more directed towards the licensure process than others. And I intentionally went to UVA knowing that it would be a more diverse education and a more broad, I took a lot of poetry and things like, you know, things mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have been able to do elsewhere. But um, I, had, I pretty much knew by early in high school that I would be an architect whatever new, because clearly, yeah. heard, but I knew from when I was in high school that that's where I was headed. Um, I took a lot of summer programs in architecture, even in high school, and was pretty goal driven from very early on that that's the direction I was heading. Yeah, so I think you know, when you're talking about the passion for performing, I think successful performers, I think often have a kind of a single mindedness um, that there's really nothing else they want to do. Well, I performed a lot in high school with a friend of mine who coincidentally also went on to become an architect. And he said, we were talking about like, what are we going to do when we grow up? Are we giving this up? Where are we applying to college? And he said, the fact that we're having this conversation, it's over. We are not going to be performers. We would not be having this talk about what else we might be interested in if that's where we were headed, because you really do have to believe there is nothing else on I mean and I work with a lot of performers now and they really do understand that for them there is not another choice um, so mm -hmm. I think I think I always knew that um, I think I have a pretty solid self-awareness of my strengths and weaknesses and knew that I was not headed into professional performing um, I think Sometimes I wish I had been more aware that there were ways that I could have combined those interests and not just thought, well, it's a hobby and this is my job, um, you know, which I sort of came to later, obviously, as I found my way into theater. But um, at the time, I really did think of them as distinct, that I was a performer as a hobby and that at some point I would not be a professional, so I would just give it up and go and handle my, you know, education and my job. And that would be the end of that. Mm -hmm. um, so you've, uh, you've worked in the building design field and that gave you some opportunities to combine your technical and artistic and you've worked in technical theater. And that also gave that, how would you compare those two activities uh, in terms of the way that they let you combine your skills and collaborate with people? Hmm. Um, well, I, I think that the technical and the creative in theater is a little bit more of a mashup. Um, I think that because what we do isn't quite as tightly regulated, I mean, I don't mean it to sound like completely dangerous, but we're not building 100 story buildings. So there's a little bit and what we do is often a one off. So sometimes we're trying to solve a problem and it's not been done in that way before and sort of the integration between the creative intention and the design and the engineering is new um you know we're often talking with the engineers about wanting pieces of scenery to move with music so there's a lot of um creative freedom and there's a lot of integration between the creative team and the engineering team we sort of all work together a lot of trial and error. It's a lot less of a known entity. I think that um, when I worked in architecture, because a lot of it is just pure like life safety issues and the scale of what 
is being built is often, I mean, the buildings I worked on when I was working at Dean Nordenson's office, like it wasn't, you know, an eight foot by eight foot platform, you know, that one person was going to dance on. You're talking mm -hmm. about buildings that have to withstand earthquakes and, you know, gale force winds and the, the, uh, breakdown of the individual professions is a little bit more distinct in architecture. Um, so I felt like my work in between disciplines had more to do with just communication, um, conveying intent and then sitting back and, and letting somebody do the real engineering. And um, I'm a little more involved in, I think, both sides of it in theater. It's a little more fluid. Mm -hmm. Um, and mm -hmm. a lot more trial and error, just because it's a little less dangerous, you know, <laughs> so it's, you can just, you can just try something and see how, you know, in, we, we set things up in the scenery shop and we try it and sometimes it crashes and then we try it again in a different way. So it's a little bit more experimental. Yeah. And I definitely, I mean, I found, it was very interesting, like, I definitely find that being able to talk to people who are approaching a problem from the technical side and who are approaching the problem from a creative side is a very different skill set. Um, and that part of my job is very similar. Um, one of the reasons that I found myself where I did even in the architecture profession was because I enjoy speaking both those languages. Um, and I find the challenges of technical design to be as interesting and as creative as the ones on the, you know, sort of artistic creative side. And I think that both teams can feel when you're interested in what they're working on and it helps with the collaboration. So, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't, when I was working on the MoMA, I worked a little bit on the MoMA renovation, the Museum of Modern Renovation in 2004. And, you know, being able to speak to an architect and engineer and use their language and understand their challenges and convey that you respect both of their processes as creative processes is um, not, I mean, it's not a universal skill. And quite a few people in both theater and architecture on both sides of that kind of technical creative divide often talk around each other and down towards each other and and don't see themselves as collaborating towards an end goal. And so I think I found my, I find myself in that collaborative position often because I do find both sides interesting and creative. And I think that that passion comes across when I'm talking to people. So they want, they want to continue the conversation. Yeah, I'll say, I mean, if I'm happy to hear you. I think one of my primary goals in teaching is to teach creative people how to the, the language of technical issues and how to do that. And I maybe going on that, I think what, what, what skills did you in your say, what part of your education sort of helped you with that kind of collaboration to talk to people in other fields? What, what do you think were the important parts of your education or your experience that, that helped you do that? Well, you know, it, I mean, I, when I first took structural engineering in architecture school, I, I loved it and I was, a little bit, I mean, <laughs> I hope it's okay to say this, a little bit in the minority among my, my oh, yeah. classes. I knew that. Were there to draw and felt that an engineer would ultimately do that part of the job and that it was not interesting to them to learn this. I found it incredible. And one of the things along the way, both at UVA for you and then for Guy, when I was at Princeton in graduate school, I was a teaching assistant for the structural engineering classes. And I love to teach. And I found that breaking down the, the way that gravity and the earth and physics and all of that work for creative people was really exciting for me. And having the opportunity to do that in school both as a student and then as a teaching assistant helped me really hone my way of thinking about a problem from both a creative side and an art, uh, from an artistic side and an engineering side, and then finding the language to explain to somebody creative 
what, you know, why a limitation shouldn't be seen as a limitation and that it could actually be seen as an opportunity and how to really understand how what we want to put out there in creative design interacts with the with the earth and the world around us and the forces on it and that really um you know it was a different conversation in architecture because you're really talking about you know forces and a building standing up and all of that but in what i do now um it helped me talk about everything from budget to um the way automation mechanics work and what is feasible to achieve and what just isn't and why and um you know what the biggest skill i will say which i think is a little off of your question but across the board i think that present that architecture school the greatest thing i learned bar none of my entire education was presenting my work in front of a jury and i think that professionally it's the one thing that i could not live without and that everybody in every field should go through the experience of an architecture school jury it's so formative i think for all everybody who went through architecture school talks about that having to stand up if i don't know if everybody here even knows what that means but in architecture school when you do a design project at the end of the project you hang it on the wall you stand in front of it and you present your work to a panel of faculty and professionals for feedback and it's really horrible <laughs> it's like just you know but you learn to stand up and you learn to present your ideas in a clear way you learn to hear questions process them think on your feet formulate defense of your actions and then clearly articulate them and i can always tell there are some set designers who went to architecture school and when they're speaking in meetings, I know which ones went to architecture school. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that is the number one thing I couldn't live without yeah. of my education. Uh, so there are skills involved in collaboration, especially creative and uh, technical collaboration. I think also in the time you've worked in the theater, you've seen a lot of change in the way that the technical side works, things like that. What are the, what are the skills you think you need, or what have you found to be your valuable skills in learning to adapt as the as the whole situation where things are changing? What what's been useful to you to, to be able to stay up with that change? Um, I mean, some of the skills are just hard production skills like drawing, drafting, and speed. Um, I think one of the biggest changes in the industry over the last. 20 years is the pace at which projects are expected to move um, as things become more and more expensive um, the faster they want to get them in front of an audience so the amount of time that we're given to design document and produce our work and then get it into the theater has gotten tighter and tighter and the staff has gotten smaller and smaller because the more money you spend on the front end the longer it takes to turn a profit um, and I mostly work in commercial theater. And even in the not-for-profit theater world, they're still running on grants and budgets. So everyone is looking to turn around a product as quickly and efficiently as possible. So, um, you know, one of the skills to keep up with the business is just to keep your actual hard production skills um, really new and not get rusty. Um, and, you know, kind of keep your hands in the trenches. So I do a lot more management now than I did when I first started in the business, but I always try to do as much of my own drawing as I can um, and kind of keep pace on all of that. Um, I think the other thing, like a skill that is really challenging, but that is really important in my role um, is being able to listen to a lot of conflicting priorities and try and distill them into the best collaborative compromise. I mean, compromise often sounds like you're giving up on something, but the best possible, in the best possible world, find the set of priorities that is gonna serve the greatest number of the creative and technical staff. So in, you know, in my role in as, so as, the, as an associate set designer, um, really your job is to be 
um, helping all of the different team, creative team members, but also being the go-between between between the entire creative staff and the entire technical staff on the project. And so, you know, I have to be able to quickly move between supporting the director and making them feel that everything they want is important and that I'm hearing everything they want and everything that they need and then also turn around and hear the general manager and understand all the budgetary constraints. And did you have to say need with air quotes? Did I you? did. That's, <laughs> I mean, one of, our, one of our real jokes is that like, you know, everyone in the industry, everyone in a theater pro collaborative theater project has a very specific role. And there are many people whose role it is to, even though they know this is not true and we've all been through this a thousand times and in the end they are going to let go of certain ideas that can just not be executed given the parameters i won't say constraints but the parameters of the commercial production um, their job for a certain amount of time is to behave as if we are all going to die if we don't get all of these things and then there's other people whose job is even though they've been through it a million times and they will in the end come up with more money than they said they will to behave as if there is not a penny left in the project. And then there's my job, which is to be able to hear all of those things, make sure everyone feels that they're being listened to. That's like super critical. Everybody on these projects is an artist and is super passionate about what they're doing and they're trying to make a product that brings joy into the world. I mean, really everybody who does what we do feels so strongly that this is something important in the world. And it makes everybody very intense and very passionate. And, you know, my job is to keep everybody cool, make sure everybody feels listened to, try to really hear the nuance in all of the priorities coming from all the different places and help them find their way to an answer that makes everybody feel like we're putting a good product out there. Um, and it's a, it's a challenging role because there are days where I feel more like my design hat is on and I get really frustrated that I'm make, that I'm doing value engineering and budget cutting. And there are days where I feel like the rending of garments over like the changing of a paint color is so ridiculous. And like, come on, we all know where this is going. Can we just agree to use the cheap paint? Like, come on, how many times are we going to do this? But that's where I found my joy is bringing those people together and helping them all achieve their goal, which is a great artistic product at a price and schedule that means that we can do another one someday and that this won't be the very last production that the investors will ever put on. So there's something to be said for that as well. You just mentioned uh, that uh, you've uh, had a role as an associate scenic designer and the it, I, almost all of your credits for the past 10 years or more as an associate scenic designer, that, that seems to be the role that you like. Or, and can you talk about that and, and why, why you would prefer that role to say being scenic designer or some other role in the yeah. team? Well, it, it's interesting because it's a new job that only has come into existence in really the last 20 years. Um, because the pace of theater is moving very, very fast, um, and the risk in working with a designer that a director or producer has never worked with feels very high because you're putting a lot of money into these projects. Um, what has happened is that the model of our industry in the design world used to be that you came out of school, you apprenticed as an assistant to make a living for a little while, and then eventually you moved on and you opened your own studio. So it was school, assistant apprentice designer. Um, just the economics of it all has meant that there are fewer and fewer designers working on Broadway. And they're going, they do tend to go back to a very limited proven group of people. Like a producer feels like this is a designer I know. Um, but the projects move very fast and they've become extremely technically challenging. So, you know, Back in a hundred years ago, a set was painted flats and painted muslin drops hanging and somebody pulled a rope and the drops went in and out and that was the whole thing. You know, now we're talking about 
tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars in automation machinery that has a whole skill set in understanding. It's all computer programmed. You have to know how to program them. You have to know how to work with the carpenters who are running it. And it's a different skill set than being a designer and a painter and an artist. And those two forces, the fact that the technical skills have become more demanding and the pace has become more demanding has given birth to this in-between job that is only beginning to find its footing as a profession and a goal in and of itself um, where you really are often shepherding multiple projects along. Um, you need to be able to speak the design language and I do a lot of design, but you also need to be able to speak the technical language. And I, you know, there's, how did I end up here? Um, there's the purely professional answer, which is, you know, I really love collaborating. I really love working on a team. Um, I love finding a compromise that makes people feel good about where we are. Um, and I have skills, technical and artistic, and I sort of found a sweet spot that makes me feel fulfilled. Um, I think it's worth saying that there is a big part of it that is my personal life as well. Um, it is a very demanding profession. Um, designers and sort of the very like title page staff of a theatrical project pretty much work 24 seven all year. They are on call to be in the theater whenever a show demands and has very little flexibility to say, I'm sorry, that doesn't work for me. Um, and I wanted a family and it's a very hard profession to combine with a family. It is not a particularly family friendly industry. Um, the hours don't really jive with little kids. And I found that I could be in this job, I could be really busy and really fulfilled, and I could still have kids and make it sort of work. I mean, I don't know that anybody who has a job and a family feels like they're kind of pulling it together, especially not right now, but, but um, certainly it felt like a manageable place for me to land and be able to be successful at work and successful at home in a way that I could live with. Yeah, so you know, what I'm hearing you say is you, you have these people who are at the extreme, so the sort of people at the creative extreme and people at the financial extreme and maybe the technical extreme. And it's the, you know, there's people, the sky is falling and we're running out of money and you're kind of there to say, we'll be okay, we can work this out. Yeah. Um, and that that associate role is actually is more of a collaborator. And, and you're, I, think, I think you're shying away from the word compromise and I think you could reasonably say optimize. Yeah. You've got all these competing I, concerns. I think that the the best work comes when there are people at the extremes. I think that the work would be terrible if any one extreme took over, but that the best work comes when each of those very intense extreme positions comes to the table. So it's really set up that way on purpose. You know, you have one person in each job you have a you know head engineer you have a head costume designer a head lighting designer a choreographer you know one of each and each person comes to the table and is tasked with being um, completely inflexible and refusing to give an inch on their priorities that they are there to represent that aspect of the artistic process and then there are people that, that are brought to the table specifically in my position who are by nature collaborative and optimizers. And that's what we do best is we get all of these people to work together and come up with the best solution. Um, and I, I find that for me more interesting. So that's like a personal, you know, I would be very sad to not be drafting, to not be in the construction shop, to not be working with carpenters and only be doing the kind of purely creative design part of it. But I would also, I did try early, very early in my theater career, I tried working as a production manager and a carpenter. 
and I was finding things that need to be fixed that the set designer hadn't seen yet. And I almost lost my job. <laughs> It was one of my very first jobs. I left architecture. I took an internship in theater. I interned for the production manager because I thought it would be the most diverse internship position to learn a lot of different trades and see what I wanted to do. And then I took a job as a production manager and I realized very quickly that I am too artistic to be that person because their job is really to always focus on the most efficient and the most budget conscious way. So I found my way to the middle between those two things and kind of found a happy home. Yeah, I'd say when, when advice I give to students who are getting ready to go out to work is like, you know, whenever you, whenever you can, if you have a job where you can go and talk to the people who are trying to read your drawings and build from them, um, that's, a, that's a great experience. Yes. And, uh, and humbling. I taught, um, I taught professional practice for associate scenic designers and I had all of the shop guys and the production carpenters come and speak to them and tell horror stories about the drawings they received and what it was that they needed to do and how truly expensive it is to the project when you're producing bad documentation and it's slowing down the construction process. So it is really um, critical to kind of understand all the people who are using your work output and how they're mm -hmm. using it and how to make their lives run more smoothly. Yeah. And so uh, in addition to, you know, in addition to theater, there's lots of entertainment industries, you know, movies, television, video games, all involve this kind of collaboration of creative and artistic people. Um, if you have, advice for young people who are interested in getting into fields like that in terms of what what kinds of education should they pursue or things like that what would you what would you say um i mean it's a little tricky because some of the really hard skills like model making and drafting um you really just have to have them like if you want to go into costume design you do need to be able to draw and render, you know, that kind of fashion drawing that, you know, you see a lot of fashion designers doing that kind of drawing. Um, and same thing in lighting design, there's some pretty specific software that everybody has to know. Um, so obviously, you know, people coming out of schools who are really getting that training can get jobs and make a living because they have those hard skills. Um, but I do think that a lot of that you can get along the way. Um, I think the biggest challenge is figuring out where you're headed because I have seen a lot of people go to school and come out with a set of skills and then realize that they would like to, you know, move into a different aspect of the profession and they've over, um, Specialized. overly specific training. Um, so I think that, I mean, I wish that everybody could do an internship before they went to school. I mean, I know that's like a crazy, like, that's not mm -hmm. how college in this country works. Um, but, you know, if there's any way, even as a young professional, I mean, I don't think anybody here is still headed off into training, but you know, the idea of getting out into the profession, trying to talk to as many people as you can um, and learn as many different kinds of jobs out there and try to get a sense of where you're headed. Um, my internship was probably was the most valuable experience I had getting into theater. Um, I mean, I had to get have the skills from school, but um, I think the hardest thing to do is figure out what skills you want. And my biggest advice would be most people in most entertainment industries love to talk. Um, I've had coffee with so many people just out of school. Um, if you're polite and you write a nice note and you respect somebody's time and don't assume that you know every professional can immediately find an hour to, you know, talk to you, most professionals will find time to talk to you. And everybody I work with 
um, tries to do as much speaking to young graduates, just like coming into our studio to ask some questions. Um, and I think that's the most helpful thing you can do before you, especially before you go off to graduate school or something like that, is to really try to see what's out there. I mean, I just didn't even know that the job I had now existed when I was choosing schools. Um, I didn't even know it was a thing. And if I had just talked to a few more people and heard, and heard somebody say, oh, well, I'm a production manager. I don't even know what that is. Um, and kind of suss out what the interests are and then try to be a little bit more focused in choosing to find the skills that are the best for your profession. I mean, I think everybody needs to know how to write and everybody needs to know how to edit and speak and all of that. But I think, you know, I think the harder thing is figuring out what other skills and a lot of people go into the entertainment fields and end up doing this long process of going through, you know, I have one friend who um, studied costume design, ended up working at for Jim Henson's company, building puppets, ended up becoming a production manager for a puppet shop, and then became a production manager, and then got more interested in budgets, and then became a general manager, and they're the ones who run all of the budgets, and then went back to law school and now does entertainment law. So it was like this incredibly circuitous process. And it's how I think a lot of people in the entertainment world end up because I don't think that entertainment as a profession is particularly well understood when you're young and choosing college and things like that. Like I think people are like, oh, you can be a director or an actor, but I don't think people really understand how there's like an infinite number of weirdly specific jobs in the entertainment world. Um, and if you're interested in entertainment and you want to find your way, the only way to get there is to just try to talk to as many people as possible. Um, you know, if you're into uh, theater, read the back, go to see a show and then read the back of the playbill. Um, every single person who works on the show is listed. That's how I decided to take an internship in production management because I saw production management in the back of the playbill and I was like, that's interesting. I like making things and I'm pretty good at managing people. Maybe I could, you know, so I think it's just about exploring. Um, if you're into TV, like pause and look at the credits and look at all the different jobs that are there and anything that kind of seems interesting. I mean, there wasn't the internet when I re really, but now you can just Google like what's a gaffer and, you know, get a sense of like all the different jobs that go into the world and find your place. And it's probably not where you thought it would be. Yeah, and I, I think uh, I think another point you've got to is kind of knowing what kind of person you are, that are you, are you one of these people who's on the extremes of whatever it is, or are you one of the people in the middle who's trying to bring them all together and understanding that about yourself uh, is an important thing to figure out as you're moving along. I, th I think, um, you know, that's hard because I, I do think, and I think that's some of the journey through a career. And it's, a, it's you know, to know that right out of school is, you know, I could look back and say, oh, if only I had realized that, you know, I spent a lot of time in architecture school loving structural engineering classes and getting like shade from classmates because like you're not supposed to like those classes and then you know, taking a job, I took a job out of graduate school in a structural engineering firm. And, you know, that was considered slightly weird. Um, and then- It's a pretty cool engineering firm. Uh, it is a pretty cool <laughs> engineering firm. You'd be surprised at how, uh, well, you probably wouldn't be, but how judgmental architecture students are. On their oh, yeah, right. Voices. <laughs> so, you know, it was like, it's, you know, finding your way and finding, um, what you're good at and what feels fulfilling to you. It, that, that, I think that's a bit of the journey. And, you know, if, if you know that about yourself straight out of school, like amazing. I mean, I certainly didn't. And it took me a long time to find my way to the job that best fit my skills and to also realize that, you know, being in a job that I'm good at and fits my skills is a kind of success that felt worthwhile to me. 
you know, and that it didn't have to be um, the success that another classmate identified as what they considered being successful yeah. as a chosen, yeah. and I, especially and I in think... entertainment. Um, I will say that being an associate in the entertainment world is um, a very ego-free place. Like you have to really want what's best for the project and want to come up with the best solution and not need anyone to know it was your idea. Like that's a big, and that's, there are a lot of people who realize very quickly that that's not their spot, you know, which is totally fine. Like not everybody should be that person. Um, but it's, you know, it's like not for everybody, but if it, but when you do find your weird combination of different skills and different jobs, like you can tell. So that's, you know, a worthy journey. Yeah. And I, I think uh, that's that idea of knowing what kind of person you are. It, it, it is, that's part of the journey. You talked about the guy who started with puppets and became a lawyer. And I think, you know, with each job, he was probably kind of realizing what his skills and interests were and what kind of person he was and, and yeah. gradually finding that way. And I think that is part of our journey in life is figuring out who we are and uh, that'll help us make those decisions. I think that's a great transition to our Q&A. Um, so if you all have any questions that you would like to ask, just drop them in the Q&A um, on the bottom room and we will field those. But in the meanwhile, while we're waiting for any questions, we had a question come up in an Eventbrite, Eventbrite registration asking about, especially like career transitioning, um, when you have work experience, how do you transition into scenic, whether it be associate, design, any of the facets in that world? When you have experience in another related field? It wasn't or specific, so How do you I get guess, into it without coming out of school? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've definitely had a lot of people, you know, get in contact with us, for example, um, looking to come an intern in scenic design it's a little challenging because we do have this very specific set of hard skills so you know i can take somebody in the office who has never worked in theater if they can draft because i can put them to work and i can explain to them what they're drafting i can't teach somebody autocad you know automated drafting like in you know in a day and then mm. put them to work. Same thing, we build very specific scale models. So, you know, we do get a lot of people out of architecture because our skills translate quite smoothly. When you have somebody coming in who's like, I used to, you know, be a violinist and I'm realizing I kind of want to get into set design, it's a little harder. Um, if you're interested in entertainment in general, there are a lot of jobs where people are really just looking for somebody who's a good communicator a good collaborator. Um, you know, there's all these positions like company management. Those are the people who deal with all of the logistics that have to do with the performers. Everything from contracts to pantyhose to like sign-in sheets and travel arrangements. And their ability, I mean, I could never do that job. Their ability to absorb like hundreds of artists angst about flights and looking their best and getting on stage and all the things they need and rehearsal needs and rehearsal rooms and directors having a panic, you know, their stage managers and company managers, you know, they are like, you know, I, I'm going to say den mother, but like, of course they're men and women, but it, they're, they can just absorb this incredible amount of information and so much personality from all of these intense artists. And you could come to that with just an interest in being in the world in theater and some writing skills and a strong, you know, communi be a strong communicator and somebody will take you under their wing and teach you what to do. You know, the, and the day to day um, is very transferable. And that's why, you know, some of it depends on whether you do want to go back to school. Um, I had just when I decided to work in theater, I was really only a year out of graduate school. And I was like, I cannot go back to school. Like I want to work in theater, but I'm only going to do this. If my skills transfer, I cannot go to school again. Like I'm done. So 
you know, I found my way into a job that I could do with the skills I had. Um, if you want to go back to school, there are enormous number of internships, paid internships. There are scenic, there are scenic design internships where they will teach you how to build models. I mean, it, some of this then gets into what your specific like financial ability to like work for pennies and live in New York City. I mean, that's a whole other mm -hmm. conversation about breaking into this business. Um, but you know, I think I think that advice would be to check out, there are so many amazing internships, almost, I mean, again, like everything's shut down right now, but all, every not-for-profit theater company, the Roundabout Theater Company, Manhattan Theater Club, Manhattan MCC, the Atlantic Theater, every single one of them, the public theater, all has internship programs in every single office in their entire organization from finance to design. And, um, you know, they're like six month programs and they'll get your foot in the door. And if you work hard and have an aptitude for it, people will ask you back, you know, it's a small profession and it's like, they're looking for hard workers who can, so if you find your role, that's a really good way in. I mean, obviously going back to school is always a way in. It's just like a hugely financially challenging way in to like make that step. For me, I think I just knew I wanted to be in the world of theater. And I thought, okay, here are my skills. Let me go find what I can do with these. And that's how I ended up in set design. Great. Um, I have a question. And I'm curious about sustainability in scenic work, um, both in like commercial theater and non-commercial theater. Like, is it a priority, especially with all the new science that we're continuously learning about our environment. Is that something on the radar, especially since theater is so like limited in time that we're using the materials? Um, I mean, I think there is a lot of interest in material choices and efficiency in engineering um, and in using the best possible materials. I, I think it's a, there is a, a long way to go um, because everything we make is sort of a one-off. And when the show is gone, um, you, there's not really a use for those pieces on one hand. And on the other hand, they're also somebody's artistic intellectual property. So it's not like you're gonna take a set or costumes and then just like send them around for every high school group to use. So there's a little bit, uh, you know, there's a, there is some much more emphasis now on, um, you know, kind of trying to store things and reuse them for subsequent productions, but it is really challenging because they are sort of art pieces. And then it, and between the intellectual property and the fact that they're not really applicable often to the next mm. job, I wouldn't say it's the best profession in terms of recyclability of things when they're finished. I mean, there is a lot of stuff going on really specifically with trying to save as much of the mechanics and stuff like that as, and most of that stuff is, um, there's a core group of construction shops that provide all of the Broadway scenery and mechanics and all of that stuff is reused and recycled. But the actual like artistic shell of it, not so much. Um, it's good though. These kind, now I'm going to think about that and it's going to come <laughs> the next conversation. Um, yeah. I think we do follow the building industry. So the more green materials come into existence, the more they'll be used in theater. Yeah. But we're so small that I don't think we're driving a lot of the progress in that area. You know, it's like the amount of, you know, plywood that we use compared to the building industry is sure. certainly not anybody go out and try to come up with something clever, you know, right. so, it, but we, we do, you know, the construction shops do follow um, innovation, but, you know, again, it's like, it needs to be, it needs to become more and more of a priority in the country because there's an economics to it and it raises the price, which then raises ticket price. You know, it's that whole like spin of, mm -hmm. you know, if we build everything out of like a paint that costs more money because it's 
done in a more environmentally friendly way and those are tending to cost more now than some other things like who varies you know where does that cost end up is it in the audience's pocket it's just right you know i think it's the same challenge that all industries are really facing right now is you know until we get a little help on the regulatory side it's really hard to make some of those hard choices from from a budget perspective yeah but that totally makes exactly. sense now i want to go and talk to some of the construction shops a little bit more about that. <laughs> yeah cool um and then how does your design process kind of change and differ if it does between um like a or would it if it was a stand-up show a stand-up comedy show broadway off broadway um something that tours how does your process change based on i guess the genre or the venue i guess I think the front end of the design process does not change that much. We're, we're always kind of looking at like, you know, we see what we do as a lens a little bit, like a frame through which the piece is seen. And obviously like with a stand up comedy show, you know, what are you trying, what is, what is the, the meaning of the narrative is a little bit of a different conversation than like a checkoff mm -hmm. play, like, you know, um, but we do, I mean, we did the, John Mulaney, Kid Gorgeous at Radio City a couple seasons ago. And, you know, we did approach that like, this is the filter through which an audience member is understanding the, the show. And so what message, I mean, that's a little, you know, sometimes it's more messagey and metaphorical and sometimes it's not, but it's like, what, what are we adding to the storytelling? You know, what, what is the frame that we're looking at this piece of theater through adding to what the audience is taking away from the words on the page. So I think that that conversation from in our design process is always there. Um, you know, the, the more metaphorical and challenging the script is, um, the more kind of intriguing and complex those conversations can be. Um, you know, what does it mean to set the story of someone's life in a crumbling train station? And what does it mean to set it in, you know, some, an apartment on the Upper West Side, you know, to tell the same story? Um, where it gets very different is after that initial design process, because um, how we build and manufacture scenery to go on tour is like, in eight hours, it has to completely come apart, fit in a truck. You have six trucks, you know, you truck it to the next place. You have four hours to set it up, four hours to rehearse, and then the audience shows up. That's very different than a six week Broadway load in, and it's gonna sit there for hopefully a decade. Um, so the logistics of each of those things is hugely different, um, but the design process is not as different as you'd think. Cool, great. And we have one question that came up. Janelle, do you want to ask that? Yeah, sure. Okay, so how did you know you wanted to be in theater? And can you trace your roots of that? All right, how did I know what? You wanted to be in theater, and then how did you trace your roots of that? I'm sorry, I, the question is really breaking oh. up. Let, let me I try. Wanted, how did I know I wanted to be involved in theater? Yes. And can you trace your roots back for us? Well, my, my mom sang opera and I grew up going, one of my family's big things was to come up to New York. I grew up in Maryland to go to the Metropolitan Opera. Um, and I grew up dancing and just always loving the theater. Um, I, I never really saw it as a profession, but it was always a passion. Um, and then it really wasn't until I had moved to New York and was here working as an adult and just attending theater as an audience member that I was kind of reading the programs and going, oh, look at all these people and they do this for a job and I wonder what that is and I wonder if I could do it, um, that I really started thinking about it as something that I could pursue. Awesome, thank you. Jack, do you wanna get the next one? Yeah, so how, how do you juggle your home life and 
your work life? Like how, how, where's that balance? How long did it take to kind of settle into a sort of balance? Uh, I don't think you ever feel like you have that in balance. Um, I think that's kind of a universal challenge um, in theater in particular. Um, just the fact that it's performances at night and all of that kind of stuff, it doesn't really lend itself to family life. Um, it, it did take a while um, to, and, it's, and like I said, it's part of why I sort of found this spot in the field um, because I'm not the one that the director calls at 10 o'clock at night. Um, I also, I mean, I've just been very fortunate um, that I teamed up with a designer who's really respectful of my family life. Um, Scott Pask, who I've worked with for 20 years, has just appreciates my choices and finds them valuable. Um, there are probably other designers for whom I could not be an associate because that's important to me that somebody values that part of yeah. my life. Um, so, you know, I found my way to a job that does allow me to go home at night. And I found my way to a collaborator who values those choices. And, you know, I've just worked super hard to be really fast and good at my job. So I get it done during work hours. And you know, when I, before I had kids, I used to routinely work until 11 or 12 at night. I would double check every single thing I sent out like 10 times to make sure there wasn't a mistake. And once I had kids, I just did, couldn't do it. I just didn't have the hours in the day. And I started kind of crossing my fingers and like, you know, saying a prayer when I hit send and like, hope there's not a mistake on this because I only checked it once. And I, you know, realized that the decade I spent checking everything 10 times was good practice and, um, you know, pretty good at not making those mistakes in the hours in which I've devoted to work. And I'm, I've, you know, I have made a couple of mistakes and I've owned them and the carpenters and the production teams that I work with respect that and they double check my work too, you know, and they, let me know if there's an issue and they don't sell me out to a producer. And, you know, I have that kind of team behind me making sure that, you know, I can be there for my family and do my job in the number of hours of the day that I've decided are appropriate for my own life, which is hard, but you just have to kind of draw that line. And I have found that people do respect you for drawing that line. Um, they will take and take and take as much as you will give and they will respect you when you draw that line um, as long as you work really hard when you're there and do a good job. I think that's super important to hear, especially for um, people transitioning into the professional fields, especially early career artists. And I think as a woman, that's really important to hear. So thank you for that offering. Um, and I think that's a great way to wrap it up a little bit because um, we are at time. Um, so just want to thank you again for joining us in Kirk. This has been amazing. Really nice. Thank you for having us. And thanks for inviting me. Yeah, of course. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Jack and Janelle, for organizing this event. And if you loved this event or if you're interested in the entertainment industry, please let us know. We're happy to connect you with the Who's in Entertainment community, which is a really lovely community here in New York. Um, there's also a lovely UVA Entertainment Club of Los Angeles. So wherever you are tuning in from the country, we would love to connect you with more Who's in the entertainment industry. Thanks, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks. Thanks Bye. very much. Bye.